Welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast. Our mission is to promote the Catholic intellectual tradition in the university, the church, and the wider public square. The lectures on this podcast are organized by university students at Thomistic Institute chapters around the world. To learn more and to attend these events, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. I'm actually going to give a talk about the highest good, which is a way of getting at how much we can hope for, basically, this time around or in, an, in another life. Very few contemporary philosophers sorry, are especially concerned with whether or not there is or could be a summum bonum. Of course, philosophers used to take it that developing an account of the highest good was crucial to work in ethics and political philosophy, and on some views, even to work in speculative or theoretical philosophy. That we need to understand the highest good was a commonplace in ancient Greek philosophy, for example, and the interest in what might count as the highest good survived in 18th and 19th century European philosophy. In these more recent forays into thought about the highest good, European philosophers often associated developing an account of the highest good with advancing our efforts to understand the foundations of right action, sound practical thinking, and duty. In contemporary Anglophone philosophy, these topics are generally treated as matters of morality. What such philosophers tend to frame as concern over the right rather than the good. That way of carving territory makes no sense with respect to the people I'm about to discuss. Now, it's not clear that this way of framing and directing concerns over the highest good fits any older work. It is perfectly clear that it does not fit the older work that will most concern me, work by St. Thomas Aquinas. I will not investigate the ways in which Aquinas's work on the highest good intersects with his work on acting well, but the relationship between these two strands of his thought cannot take the shape that it takes in modern thought. In this talk, I'm going to move toward Aquinas on the highest good from the side, using a philosophical puzzle to guide my exploration of the topic. The philosophical puzzle goes like this. Given that many prominent thinkers who have developed accounts of the nature and character of the highest good have argued that we cannot experience unimpeded enjoyment of the highest good in this life, in what sense can the highest good provide a target for us? Worse, some such thinkers have held that even if I'm determined to orient my life to the highest good, I cannot attain this end by my own efforts. In what sense can I so much as seek the highest good much less have confidence that I've set my sights on an appropriate object if I cannot know what it will be like in advance, and the one thing I can know is that I will never attain it under my own steam. That's the puzzle. My aim in this talk will be both to trace how these questions emerge for two modern philosophers and to offer a brief discussion of the way they arise for and maybe are addressed by Aquinas. I'll begin by having a look at John Stuart Mill and Immanuel Kant. Both are committed to the view that it's not possible for me to have unimpeded enjoyment of the highest good in this life, and neither thinks that I can attain the highest good all on my own. That is, both would appear to be operating in the context where my philosophical questions crowd in. For all that, each thinks that it's possible for me to be directed to the highest good, and each holds that it's possible for me to have some contact with it, even though I cannot experience the fullness of the good in question. For Mill, the task is to provide a world that allows for the greatest measure of a special sort of happiness for the greatest number of people. For Kant, the highest good is happiness in proportion to virtue. For Aquinas, of course, the highest good is God, and my best hope is that by grace I will be with God. Given this characterization of what I seek and see in the highest good as Aquinas understands it, the philosophical questions are stunningly more difficult to answer than when we're thinking with Aquinas, 
than they are when we're thinking with Kant or Mill. After raising the questions in connection with Aquinas' work, I'm going to draw on some aspects of his Christology to find a sort of an answer. Okay, modernists. Philosophical interest in the highest good was still alive when John Stuart Mill published his much maligned utilitarianism. Mill wrote, quote, There are few circumstances among those which make up the present condition of human knowledge more unlike what might have been expected or more significant for the backward state in which speculation on the most important subject still lingers than the little progress which has been made in the decision of the controversy respecting the criterion of right and wrong. From the dawn of philosophy, the questions concerning the summum bonum, or what is the same thing, concerning the foundation of morality, has been accounted the main problem in speculative thought, has occupied the most gifted intellects, and divided them into sects and schools, carrying on vigorous warfare against one another. And after more than 2,000 years, the same discussions continue, philosophers are still ranged under the same contending banners, and neither thinkers nor mankind at large seem nearer to being unanimous on the subject. We're no nearer than when the youth Socrates listened to old Protagoras. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. Famously, Mill held that the highest good is the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, and Mill took it that it was in our power to attain this end, although what Mill understood by happiness is far more interesting than what Jeremy Bentham or later Henry Sidgwick had in view. More than this, Mill argued that attaining the end that governed and shaped his utilitarianism demanded significant collective action political reform, and cultural change. Complaining about Bentham, Mill wrote, The problem with Bentham is that he has confounded the principle of utility with the principle of specific consequences and has habitually made up his estimation of the approbation or blame due to a particular kind of action from a calculation solely of the consequences to which that very action, if practiced generally, would itself lead. He has largely exemplified and contributed very widely to diffuse a tone of thinking according to which any kind of action or any habit which in its specific consequences cannot be proved to be necessarily or probably productive of unhappiness to the agent himself or to others, is supposed to be fully justified, and that any disapprobation or aversion entertained toward the individual by reason of it is set down from that time forward as prejudice and superstition. It is not considered, at least not habitually considered, whether the act or habit in question, though not itself necessarily pernicious, may not form part of a character essentially pernicious, or at least essentially deficient in some quality entirely conducive to the greatest happiness. When a moralist thus overlooks the relation of an act to a certain state of mind as its cause, and its connection through that common cause with large classes and groups of action apparently very little resembling itself, his estimation, even of the consequences of the very act itself, is rendered imperfect. This is like the clearest statement in Mill of why he's not a consequentialist. Right? I mean, he's not. He's rebuking Bentham for what comes to be called consequentialism. For it may be affirmed, with few exceptions, that any act whatsoever has a tendency to fix and perpetuate the state of character or mind in which itself originated. And if that important element in the moral relations of the action be not taken into account by the moralist as a cause, neither, probably, will it be taken into account as a consequence. So you can ruin your character with bad acts, and that becomes at least as important as the 
have the things you're doing. And you can strengthen your character with good acts, and that's at least as important as any immediate effects of those acts. In short, carefully read, Mill's interest was neither in the outcomes of individual acts nor in the outcomes of general adoption of one or another rule. Mill's understanding of happiness was instead rooted in concern over character and self-actualization as guided by character. Accordingly, his account of the highest good carries some of the depth of an account focused on eudaimonia and virtue. For this reason, it may be more accurate to couch Millian doctrine in terms of flourishing than it is to cast it in terms of happiness. He is, after all, the thinker who famously insisted that it was better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a perfectly content and happy swinish person. Now, it belongs to the tradition of thought about the highest good that even those thinkers who urge that we might attain the highest good through our own efforts and under our own steam, as does Mill, do not think that we can know in advance what it will be like for any individual or community of persons to attain the highest good. Mill shared this understanding. For Mill, as for many of his venerable predecessors, we are bound to aim for the highest good, even though we cannot know in detail what will be involved in sharing in the life of a community that manages to attain the highest good. We are bound to seek a thing that is neither part of individual experience nor even of collective human experience more generally. How are you supposed to aim at something outside our experience? Mill's work can be read as providing a kind of via negativa in response to this question. In essays like On Liberty and the Subjection of Women, as well as in a wide range of other works, Mill set out to identify those aspects of the shared life of a human community that work against the flourishing of its members and to develop strategies to at once remove the impedative impediments and make such positive changes as might conduce to the greatest flourishing for the greatest number of community members, allowing all the while that not all members were likely to take advantage of the opportunities made possible by social, political, and cultural reform. It is possible that in urging that we try to understand the highest good in order to better understand the foundations of morality, Mill may have been drawing from the work of my second modern, Immanuel Kant. Understanding the concept of the highest good in Kant is a complicated matter. matter understanding anything in Kant is complicated. <laughs> <clears throat> Kant insists that happiness is an aspect of the highest good, where the desires or inclinations associated with happiness belong to what Kant calls self-love. But the happiness at stake in the highest good for Kant is happiness in proportion to virtue, and virtuous dispositions seem instead to carry the universality at issue in Kant's understanding of the moral law. Now, it's not obvious how the dual aspect of the highest good can be brought into relation, much less welded together as a totality that is the supreme object of the will of a finite sensuous, rational being. I will rely on Stephen Engstrom's sort of magisterial interpretation to bring Kant into this exploration of thought about the highest good. According to Kant, finite, dependent, sensu sensuous beings are necessarily interested in their own happiness, where happiness is understood in terms of satisfaction of desires, inclinations, and needs. As the practical face of self-love, desires, inclinations, and needs are among those features of agency that serve to distinguish one sensuous rational being from every other such being. Um, my own reading developed over a long time, having to try to figure out Kant, it goes kind of like this. He thinks there's two, basically, sources of rational action. There's the stuff he calls self-love. That's everything about my practical orientation that makes it different from any one of yours. Like, 
I'm the only one married to Hank. She makes me very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only one whose sister Lisa is a complete delight. I mean, I apologize if any of you have a delightful sister Lisa. Lisa Winans, anyway. <laughs> um, I've had various relations with non-human animals that none of you have had with exactly those animals and so on and so forth. Everything in my motivational landscape that makes me different from any other sensuous, dependent, rational being belongs over in that department. The only thing that we all have a com in common, according to Kant, is that every one of us is a bearer of pure practical reason. And that's the other source of rational action, pure practical reason. So on this way of taking very seriously <coughs> Kant's way of dividing the territory of motivation, you get universalization for free. Anytime any of us does duty from the motive of duty, that being operates from exactly the same source as any other such being. So you get the universal for free in Kant. I mean, not entirely for free. You have to believe a bunch of stuff about reason to get it for free. But if you buy the stuff about reason, then you get it for free. How are you supposed to get all of this stuff together into the highest good? Angstrom puts the matter this way. Kant characterizes self-love as an ineradicable propensity of finite rational nature to claim personal happiness to be something good and end for others as well as for oneself. Self-love is a natural propensity both to pursue one's own happiness and in pursuing it to claim it to be good. In self-love's implicit claim that satisfying its desires, inclinations, and needs is good, self-love offers itself up as reasonable. Claiming a thing to be good is, for Kant, necessarily claiming to be a thing reasonably desired, rationally pursued, and so on, a candidate, at least, for universal objective regard. Virtue, as Kant understands it, is the settled disposition, the strength, to overcome inclinations that are contrary to morality. As Kant knows perfectly well, virtue, the disposition to constrain one's pursuits by the demands of moral law, comes in degrees. The proportionality aspect of the highest good recognizes this point. It asks that everyone seek to be only as happy as they are good and that every virtuous person enjoy such happiness as is compatible with good character. Both sides. This, then, is the nature of the highest good by Kant's lights. Notice that the highest good is, for Kant, as it was in a way for Mill, a totality. It's not in my power to realize this totality, even if my rational benevolence functions beautifully in my efforts to support the happiness of everyone around me to the extent that they merit happiness. As Kant argues, it's not even the power of any arbitrarily large society of finite rational beings to attain the highest good. After all, nature <laughs> need neither reward virtue nor bring ruin to the lives of the vicious. Nothing about the working of nature makes it impossible that a whole society of the mostly virtuous will not be brought low by some catastrophe like the Lisbon earthquake. And so shook fingers and constant. In this sense, none of us knows what it would be like to inhabit a natural world where the best of us was spared the many kinds of unhappiness associated with infirmity, injury, loss, and the like. And none of us can make the world such that what will happen always and everywhere coincides with what is supposed to happen. Practical reason tracks laws governing what's supposed to happen. These are not the same as empirical laws governing what will happen. It is at this point that Kant introduces two of his three practical postulates that God exists, and that the soul is immortal. These are critical for Kant. As is true for understanding Kant's account of the highest good, 
understanding Kant's claims about the practical postulate has been a po point of considerable scholarly controversy. I'm going to give a fairly simple reading of the postulates and their status. My aim is simply to show how Kant works to respond to the question how we are to see ourselves oriented to the highest good, even though we can have no direct experience of its attainment. It is, I think, strictly impossible for finite, sensuous, rational beings to have any experience of the highest good in their mortal lives by Kant's light. Kant's moral agent is finite and dependent. By definition, such agents are not in a position to bend the cosmos to their wills. They cannot enact universal laws. They cannot set laws of nature, and so on. This is the fundamental wildness of the Rawlsian reading, where I'm somehow supposed to pretend that, like, on Tuesday, I could, you know, set natural law. I'm busy tomorrow. To that extent, it cannot be in the power of the kinds of beings we are to attain the highest good under our own scheme, individually or collectively. So we can't keep nature from intruding in very, very inconvenient ways. Now, for Mill, attaining the highest good required fairly radical social, political, and cultural reform the development of modes of shared social life that are no part of anyone's experience. While he seems committed to the position that attainment of the highest good is out of reach in practice, nothing in the view suggests that it's out of reach in principle. The problem is much worse in Kant. For Kant, attainment of the highest good possible for finite, sensuous, rational being is out of reach in principle. In what sense, then, can it serve to orient our activities? Now, Kant's response to this question, if I understand him, rests in his work on the practical postulates. There are three of them, that I am free, that God exists, and that the soul is immortal. Most contemporary Anglophone scholars of Kant love the first. They really love the I'm free postulate and sort of try to ignore the other two. I confess that I have yet to encounter an interpretation of the immortality postulate that I can understand, and there is, if anything, so much philosophical support for and work on the postulate that each of us is free that I can't think what to add. So I will focus on the postulate about God. A practical postulate for Kant is a framing assumption necessary to making the fundamental operations of practical reason, as he understands these, intelligible. If it makes sense to understand finite, sensuous, rational beings as addresses of imperatives, as beings that can know the better and choose the worse, then such beings must be operating under the implicit assumption that they have the power to choose to do as they ought to do, or choose otherwise. To that extent, the whole account of finite, sensuous, rational beings as addressees of imperatives relies upon the supposition that such beings are free, a thing that cannot be proved, he insists. Their freedom is no part of their experience of themselves. It is rather a background condition on the efficacy of practical reason and that practical reasoning can be efficacious is presupposed in any exercise of practical reason. I can deliberate about what to do. I can't deliberate about whether to do it under my own steam. It's the simplest way of getting that postulate in place. So how does God get into this picture? Kant thinks that he's established that a totality consisting in happiness in proportion to virtue is the supreme object of practical reason. What each of us strives to realize, even though none of us can produce a world in which happiness is, in fact, proportion to virtue. Since my practical reasoning in any instance is constrained by what is in my power to accomplish by Kant's life, the thing that my own reason demands as its ultimate end lies entirely beyond my power. 
it's, it's demanding the highest good. We cannot make sense in my practical judgment and my efforts to cultivate virtue without seeing these aspects of my life as aimed at my participation in the highest good. I cannot direct myself to any good that's entirely unrealizable. To the extent that I operate to allow morality to constrain my pursuit of happiness, I implicitly treat happiness in proportion to virtue as realizable. I vow I will not attain my happiness by immoral means. I am implicitly for treating the highest good as realizable. God's agency is the agency that could realize the highest good, a thing that is in principle out of reach for the very creatures necessarily directed to its realization. The practical postulate that God exists secures the possibility of the highest good, the possible actual life, so the real possibility of the highest good. Kant's God is in many respects peculiar. Kant's is a strangely thin God, knowable only in the sense that its existence secures the intelligibility of various aspects of practical philosophy. It's not just that Kant aspires to a religion within the limits of reason, as Kant understands these. It's that Kant is content with a God that operates as a necessary, but strictly incomprehensible, guarantor of the intelligibility of the highest good. This is a God spun from philosophy, a God that is at best at some remove from the operations of practical reason. Even if this God created finite, sensuous, rational beings, it is not a God that directly legislates the moral law by which these beings steer their lives, which constrain their pursuit of happiness, and which set the terms for the best that any and all of them can hope to see. It's not obvious whether or how one would worship Kant's God. It's not clear in what sense one might associate this God with love. This God is, in theory, a source of providence. It is not clear in what ways this God might be, in actuality, providential, or whether or how it might concern itself with the very beings who unknowingly rely on it in cultivating the strength needed to hold fast to the moral law in action. All that's very mysterious. Things are otherwise with Aquinas. Thinking the highest good with Aquinas. Now, the highest good for Aquinas is God. Fully actual, perfectly simple, supremely good, and so on. Aquinas argues that the highest good for human creatures is the happiness of beatitude. In this life, we can know a form of flourishing that's consonant with human nature. Imperfect happiness, basically. But by God's grace, we may enjoy a more perfect happiness. Simon Gain puts the point this way. The happiness or beatitude of the human creature plays a central role in the structure of Aquinas' theology. Together with the natural flourishing of this life that is proportioned to human nature itself, Aquinas identifies a more perfect final end for human beings, which lies above their nature and in the next life a beatitude whereby they share in a higher way in the very beatitude of God, the Holy Trinity, participating in the divine nature. While their perfect or complete beatitude will extend to the human animal in its entirety, body as well as soul, sense as well as intellect, the very core of this beatitude formally consists in a vision graciously granted to the human intellect. It is this glorious act of intellect in which beatitude formally consists, because it is only in this graced act that the supreme good is somehow attained, such that even the separated soul may pass without its body from life of earth to the life of heaven prior to the resurrection. Close quote. Okay. Obviously, we cannot attain beatific vision through our own efforts alone. 
Obviously, our most perfect supernatural beatitude is no part of ordinary human experience. It is hard even to imagine what it would mean for a human intellect to share in God's beatitude. My head just goes like this. In Mill, the trouble with knowing the happiness we seek was largely a matter of practice. No one has got there yet. So, on solidly empiricist ground, none of us can know what it will be like. In Kant, there was the more profound principled problem, in willing the highest good, I will a thing entirely beyond my power to bring about. To so much as operate as if the highest good is attainable, and the picture of the highest good flows directly from abstract reflection on pure practical reason as it operates in finite sensual rational being, to so much as do that, the moral agent implicitly assumes such God as is needed to be the agent that might actualize the highest good. The highest good necessarily orients my reach and eludes my grasp on Kant's account, but the seeds of my orientation to the highest good are bound up with practical reason as such on this view. So I do not need to comprehend the God of the practical postulates in order to be directed to the good that this postulated God is introduced to make possible. Sorry, it's convoluted. That's my effort to make it easy to understand, Carl. <laughs> I can back it up with a lot of stuff. I've been working on it a long time. By Aquinas' lights, I need a source outside my own reason to seek in humility, reverence, obedience, and wonder the final end that promises to satisfy the whole restless longing of my heart by granting me a vision of God. What kind of confidence can I have that such a thing could ever be possible for me? Is there any sort of basis for my hope? I will follow Green in urging that Aquinas' account of Christ's immediate knowledge of God holds out the possibility of perfect supernatural beatitude to believers. Aquinas' understanding of the Incarnation gives the basis for a theological response to the questions about the sense in which I can orient myself to a final end that I cannot fully comprehend. I will follow Diamancini in tracing Aquinas' account of the earthly Christ's knowledge of God. Mancini, like Gain, is indebted to Bernard Lorne's work on the question of how the earthly Christ communicated something of divine knowledge to human beings. I take it that Lonergan went a step beyond Aquinas in exploring this question. Now, there have been a number of attempts to urge that Aquinas provides a metaphysical explanation for faith in the teachings of Christ. As Messini argues, this does not seem to be the tack Aquinas takes. Rather, Aquinas proceeds by understanding what the Incarnation is supposed to accomplish and tracing what has to be true of the Incarnate Word if the Word made flesh is to accomplish the teachings and salvific task that could not be accomplished unless God came among us as a human being. In effect, in order for the human Christ to know his identity and his mission, and to teach in the way that was necessary if we were to have any hope of salvation and of one day sharing in God's knowledge of God, the human Christ had to have immediate knowledge of God. As Gain put it, the Savior needed to see the Father. And, of course, in seeing the Father, needed to have divine understanding of the Trinity and that the three persons are consubstantial. This was crucial if Christ was knowingly to be who he was and do what he did. Interweaving commentary on the structure of Aquinas' discussion of the incarnate word in the Summa Theologiae and Aquinas' commentaries on scripture, Mancini summarizes Aquinas' teaching this way. Quote, what we know in faith, we know because of the preaching of Christ. From that content, we may conclude to what he knows as man in his human soul. 
But since that content either asserts or implies the identity of Christ as the word of the Father, we conclude at last both to this identity and to the divine knowledge of Christ as God. And in this order of things, the theorem of the man Christ's immediate knowledge of God becomes evident as what it is. An account, or part of an account, of the datum of faith, precisely as the datum is handed to our faith from the human preaching of the human Christ. Thus, St. Thomas knows Christ's beatific knowledge because it is required to explain the fact recorded in the Gospels and grasped by faith of what our Lord knows and tells us. St. Thomas knows the beatific knowledge of Christ as the theological glue of an argument and in the absence of a metaphysical deduction that serves as a bridge in the ordinary discipline between consideration of the soul of Christ and consideration of the properties of that soul. What we know by faith, the teaching of scripture, Jesus knew directly and immediately. And so, among other things, in Christ we have the example of a human being who knows God in the way that God knows God. It was necessary that such knowledge be communicated, however imperfectly, by a human being among human beings. That this was necessary can be seen as one of the reasons that the humanity of Christ was crucial to his mission. And it is because of the Incarnation that we can have a sense that it might be possible for us to attain our final end. As Vincini puts it, quote, knowing God in God's way, the end state of our knowledge as Christians, a state St. Thomas imputes to Christ in his earthly life, is what is called the beatific vision. By this is meant an immediate knowledge of God as he is in himself, the finite minds sharing in the infinite act of understanding the infinite intelligibility that God is. But that such a thing could happen is not known except to faith. And the idea of it is therefore just as much a sort of limit or analogical idea, indeed an analogical idea as the idea we have of God or of the Trinity or of the Incarnation. All St. Thomas really has to say about this, that if no created similitude of God could really give us knowledge of him as he knows himself to be, then this knowledge does not happen by way of a created similitude. Rather, the divine being itself is what is immediately present to the created mind. Close quote. Okay. I began by tracing some thought about the highest good in the work of two modern philosophers, John Stuart Mill and Immanuel Kant. Mill took himself to be working in a tradition of thought that stretched back to Plato. It is unlikely that Kant had any less exalted an understanding of his treatment of the topic. Kant always thinks he's doing the most and the best on purpose, and it took a long time to get there. Both took on the thought that in directing my efforts to my final end, to the highest good, I aim at something which, of which I have no experience. Mill had only a sense of what might be required for human flourishing to go on, got largely through identifying what he took to be impediments to flourishing. In his own odd way, Kant introduced a kind of datum of rational faith to help us understand the possibility of the totality that is our ultimate aim. I thought with the two of them in order to explore some of the possibilities of a strictly philosophical attempt to understand the highest good. <laughs> what we got from even the small foray into Aquinas on the topic is theological and, I think, clearer. The highest good is God. God is at once creator and legislator, and an economic account of how we come from God and are, by grace, headed back to God through the salvific identity and mission of Christ provides a structured account of our lot, the darkness in which we find ourselves, and the kind of light we can hope to enjoy because of Christ. I've offered no more than a little sketch of what Aquinas gives us. I hope that it's enough of a sketch to provide a sense of the depth and power of the account. Thank you all for your attention.
Thanks for listening to this lecture on the Thomistic Institute podcast. The generosity of people like you makes this podcast possible. If you enjoy these talks, please consider showing your support at www.thomisticinstitute.org slash donate. Your donation of even a dollar helps us reach more college students and many others with the powerful truths of the faith, and it ensures that we can keep publishing top-notch lectures on this podcast. Thanks a lot.